Well, good morning, everyone. I, you guys had a week of talking about our missionaries without me last week, and this past week I also was able to go out to Idaho to MAF and do a, a conference that they support um, that they just started this year, and it was, well, it was impactful in a couple of different ways. I got to see some amazing preachers uh, that just were knocking it out of the park, were just great at what they do. And then the second thing that happened is made me feel really inadequate <laughs> after hearing those guys. So I want you to bear with me this morning as I'm battling through these fears of inadequacy as we jump into a new series we're calling Who, What, or, and Why. I must have told Brian it was where. But <laughs> who and what and why. Um, I want to talk to a few of you older folks in the congregation. I'm not going to say who's older, all right? That's up to you to decide. Um, but I'm going to walk you down memory lane just a little bit. Do you remember in math class that we had to memorize these things called if-then statements, right? And if you didn't, if you memorized them, then you had better take good notes. Can we move on to the next slide then? Um, if, there we go. It's an if-then statement. If you didn't memorize them, you, you had to really be careful and go over them from time to time. They would be questions on tests. As a matter of fact, it, it didn't really seem even like math, did it? If we knew those first two things to be true, then we would know that this third thing is also true. I, and I really didn't enjoy these types of classes. I don't know about you, but the concept of the if-then statement has turned out to be true in other areas of my life as well not just in math. If I can determine if it is true, if something is accurate, then I can take that piece and discover the other things about it must also be true. There are all sorts of if-then statements that happen in real life outside of geometry. Uh, computer programming is built on if-then statements. If certain criteria are met, certain things happen, then the programming will make sure that the appropriate response is to follow. There are other if-then statements, stuff like, if you work overtime, then you'll be paid time and a half, right? woo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> At least you should be paid time and a half, isn't that right? <laughs> There's a blog out there for young mothers dealing with children and dealing with some of the burdens of raising children. You guys all know about that. Um, the blog was addressing how not to allow broken expectations to ruin your day. And so they took a bunch of these if statements and then they made a bunch of other statements of things that they wish they could do during their day. And then they partnered the if statements then with some preferred actions. So they came up with stuff like this. If my husband is running 30 minutes late, that's bad news. That's a, a bad situation. Then I'm going to throw the kids in a stroller and I'm going to go for a 30 minute walk. Now this is powerful for some women because you want more exercise. They want to get the kids out. And it's going to pass the time. So by creating this if-then statement in those scenarios, you're prepared to respond to a disappointment from an unmet expectation with a positive experience then. Another one, if my daughter wakes up 45 minutes early from her nap, which is awful, moms, right? Then I'm going to vacuum the house, which is something that I couldn't do if she was sleeping, right? We take these if statements, these if conditions, and we turn them into something that could be positive. Now, an if-then statement starts with something that is known to be true, and then it works to discover an application. If you work from the opposite direction, if you start with the then, something that you can observe, but you don't know what caused it, it creates a question, and that question is this, why? You have the then, and you're looking for the if. So when you start with the application, but you don't know how you, it got to that point, then you start by asking why. And why is the opposite process of an if-then statement. <clears throat> now, if you just Google the word why, type in why, into the search bar, you're going to get some very interesting questions. Why is the sky blue? Why is the flag at half-mast? Why is my eye twitching? Why is Israel at war? It's a wide variety of questions you're going to see, and there's so many more. But notice each of them starts with an observation. The sky is blue. What caused it? What is the if? Why is the flag at half-mast? We see the flag down there. 
at half mass. It's an observation that I can see what caused it. What's the if that set that flag at half mast? Why is my eye twitching? I can feel it. I can see my eye twitching. What's causing it? What's causing Israel to be at war? And they're all answered with another word, because, right? Because, which is, well, it would be the causes what we see. It's an if-then statement, which means that if you have a question about anything, you can see the then, but you're looking at what you're looking for, the if. You need to know the if, if you're going to ask the question why. So, and that's true about everything, including this church. You're like, where's he going with this? I think I'm going to land there in just a second. Um, if you have questions about C4, then you probably need to know the if. You need to know the why. And, and if you look around, you can see the things that we do on a regular basis, right? You can make observations about that. But what's causing that? What is? What's the cause? What's the why? Why, why do we meet every Sunday? Why do we take communion every single week? Why do we sing songs? Why do we use modern instruments in worship? Why do we always ask for money? Why do we have life groups? Why do we have specific ministries for children and students? Why do we do these things? Why gets to the heart of our purpose? What is our purpose? What is our why? Now with this series, these, over these four weeks, we're going to be resetting our foundation. Uh, for those of you who haven't been a member here for 30 years or so, it's not a new foundation necessarily. It's, it's not something you've never heard before. Or you've, if you've been around here for a while, the last four years that or so that I've been here, but you've probably heard a lot of the things that you'll hear over the next few weeks if you've been here for a little while. Um, but we want to remind you, we want to reset our foundation. We want to lay out why we exist and what we do. Which means the biggest question that we have, uh, that, we are, are, that we're all aiming at, why does C4 exist? You can make an observation. You can look and see that we do, in fact, exist. You might reach out and touch the person next to you and make sure they're there. We do exist, and, and you can look and see that, but why? What causes this? Why does C4 exist? That's a, that's a big question. There are even bigger questions, and we'll answer that one in just a moment. We have to start somewhere bigger, I think. We can keep going on and on, but it'll be better for us to just cut right to the chase of this. The biggest question that we could possibly ask, the biggest question that I think any of us could possibly ask is this question, is there a God, right? Is there a God? This is our starting point. This, I believe, is every human, every person's starting point, if they're honest. Now, there are lots of ways that we can address this question. For me, though, the most compelling arguments, I believe, come back from the context of science and nature. Science and nature make some of the most compelling arguments. The vastness of our universe, the largeness of universe and space, right? It continues to be beyond what we previously understood. Now, I want you to look at this picture. I don't claim to be an astronomer. There's a lot of things I'm not, but astronomer is one of them. But I know this much. Comparing Earth to the other things uh, out there that found in this universe is drastically unfair. <laughs> and comparing our sun, our particular star, to the other stars in the galaxy is actually quite comical. It doesn't even register in comparison to some of the other incredible things out in space. And the more that we study this, the more we search, the more we find out, and the more awestruck we have to become. It is bigger and more significant, and it's not getting smaller, church. It's not getting more understood, is it? It's becoming more of a mystery as we discover more and more. And at the same time, there are, well, there are incredible intricacies found in the details of creation and life that continue to just draw wonder. It's not just the vastness. It's not just the largeness of creation, but it's the, it's the precision, right? It's the details. It's the intricacies of what has been created that continue to just blow my mind. Details like this. If you could type 60 words a minute, eight hours a day, it would take approximately 50 years to type the human genome. 
right? If you put all the DNA molecules in your body end to end, then that, that DNA strand would reach from earth to the sun and back 600 times. I look at all of nature and all of creation, right? And I see that it's too complex for random chance. It's too perfect to be an accident. I look at this world and I see that there is a causer of the world that we live in. Something put it all into being, into motion. You've heard me say this if you've been here for a while. It takes too much faith to be an atheist. It takes too much faith to be an atheist. Paul says it a similar way in Romans chapter, Romans chapter 1. Now, I know that if you don't necessarily believe in God, that you may not put a lot of credibility uh, into the Bible when we use it as a defense. It probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you, but those of us that do, uh, but take it out of the Bible and it's still a compelling argument. Paul writes this. Since the creation of the world, so that's since the very beginning, according to Paul, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities. And then he tells us what the invisible qualities are, right? It's his eternal power. It's his divine nature. Paul says that from the very beginning, that his invisible qualities, his power and his nature have been clearly seen, right? They have been clearly seen, that God has been clearly seen from the very beginning, and that he has been understood from what has been made. So his invisible qualities are seen by what is visible. His power, his nature have been made visible through creation so that men are without excuse. Now the biggest question, our number one question is, is there a God? Yes, well, I, I believe that there is a God. It's our biggest why. So if there is a God, then our second question, second biggest question is, can we know anything about him? Just because we say there are God doesn't mean that we're all talking about the same thing, does it? There are all sorts of different religions out there. There are all sorts of different ways to worship. Why is it that we believe in the God of the Bible? And I think the most significant thing that we can point to as to whether or not God has revealed himself and to why it is that we believe in the God that we believe in starts and ends with the resurrection of Jesus. It's why we celebrate it every week. And there are lots of reasons why we believe in the resurrection, right? It's hard thing to believe that someone was raised from the dead. It's complicated. <laughs> why is it that we believe Jesus rose from the dead? Well, for starters, there's the empty tomb, right? That's weird. Johnny Carson, that's weird, wild stuff. That's weird. Now, when, when bodies are put in graves, generally, they tend to stay there. Now, if he had risen from the dead, Jesus, if he had not risen from the dead, Jesus' opponents would simply have to show the body in the tomb. And they couldn't. And they didn't. Now, that doesn't mean that he rose from the dead simply from that argument, though, right? Perhaps the body was moved. That's what they might have said. Except there's a large, large number of eyewitnesses who gave testimony. It's not just one or two people claiming that they saw Jesus and then everybody else started running with these stories. But there are dozens and dozens of people who saw him. People who were right there with him, who spoke with him. And there is a consistency to their accounts and the things that they experienced with him. And perhaps even more importantly, there is the willingness of those witnesses, these eyewitnesses who saw him, the people who saw him alive after having seen him dead, there's the willingness of those eyewitnesses to die for their perspective. They claim to have seen him alive, and when put to the point of death, they refused to recant. They held on to it. Now, why is that? I believe in his resurrection. I believe it because he predicted it, right? Jesus, a man who claimed to be God, predicted his death and resurrection, and then he, well, he pulls it off. If Jesus really, truly rose from the dead, then that, is, that this man who claimed to be God said about God suddenly has a whole lot of weight to it when we see all these witnesses. What did Jesus say? What things did Jesus reveal about God? 
You know what he taught me? Jesus taught me that we, we are a mess spiritually. <laughs> You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. That, that we are all separated from God and, and that, that we just can't fix it on our own. We're just not able to. You're in such a desperate state that God saw that the only way for him to save you was for him to give himself. That there wasn't anything we could do on our own and that God loves us so much that he actually had to come and save us. Paul says it this way in Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He actually came on our behalf for our sake. And Jesus doesn't just say that you're spiritually sick, right? It's not that simple or that you're just broken. It's bigger than that. Jesus didn't show up to make sick people better. Jesus showed up to make dead people alive. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. You don't have a spiritual cold out there, folks. You're filled with death, and you can't deal with that stuff on your own. This man who claimed to be God, who, who died and resurrected, and said that someday you are going to stand before God. And what happens in that moment will be dependent on your relationship with him. Jesus says that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody comes to the Father except through him. So to sum it up, Jesus, this man who claims to be God, who predicted his death and resurrection, and then pulled it off, revealed to us who God is. And he said that we are sinful creatures. He said that we are sinful because of the choices that we've made, that we are separated from God, and that we're living an empty life in this world, and that we're facing eternal death in the next if we don't have Jesus. Jesus says you need his truth, and that you need his grace, and that you need his strength, and that you need his life, and you need his purpose, and you need his joy, and you need his peace, and you need his hope. So, so, if there is a God, and we believe that there is, and if this Jesus rose from the grave and revealed to us who God is, which I believe that he has, then if then, right, if these statements are true, then it means that we must be Christ-driven. Why does C4 exist? We exist to be Christ-driven. Then, it means that we want Jesus to be our Savior. We accept the gifts that he's offered to us through his death on the cross, that he died for our sins. But it also means that we accept him as Lord, not just Savior. He is Lord. It means that he is our authority. It means that when Jesus has an opinion, we fall in line. It means that if he speaks, we listen. It means that if he acts, we imitate it means that we want to live the way that Jesus lived. We want to do the things that he did. We want to say the things that he said. We want to treat people the way that Jesus treated people. It means that he has authority over our life. So his decisions are our decisions. We take seriously the things that Jesus took seriously. And what did, what did Jesus take seriously? Things like humility and love and truth and grace and obedience, and kindness, and service. So we take those things seriously here. If there's a God, we believe that there is, and if Jesus rose from the grave and revealed to us who God is, which I believe that he did, then we are Christ-driven, and we respond by worshiping him. We respond to this God by giving him our worship. And here at C4, we emphasize two parts of this. The first is something that happens corporately, right here, right? When we talk about worship, one piece that happens is right here in this room every single Sunday morning. It's, it's more than singing, right? We call this a worship service. Or some, sometimes we call our songs we sing, we call them worship songs. But it's even more than that. It's a weekly worship within our community, 
We believe that the Sunday morning worship, this this time that we spend together every week, even this time right now as I'm talking to you and you're listening, is foundational for your spiritual health. We believe that so much that we have worship set up for different age groups, right, within this church. We call this what you're experiencing right in here, a multi-generational worship experience in this room every week because there's lots of generations in this room right now. Um, But this isn't the only place that worship takes place in this body of believers. Right now, upstairs, there's a junior jam classroom that has worship and has a space, and they do that all in their own unique way designed for them. And right down the hall from them, there is a jam ministry. It's the slightly older kids, and they have participated in worship in a way that was designed for them. And on both Sunday and Wednesday nights, you'll find students here worshiping in ways that were designed specifically for them. And when Celebrate Recovery is here meeting in this room, their worship is a reflection of where they are on their journey, and and they do it every week. Now, the second aspect of our worship happens daily. This is the more complicated one for many of us, right? It's not just a corporate thing. There are individual things that need to happen daily. Our response to an incredible God that exists and this Jesus who rose from the grave to show us who God really is, our response is to live a life in obedience and faithfulness to worshiping him. But we also recognize that God doesn't deserve an hour of our week, right? He deserves, well, he deserves everything. Our daily decisions are an act of worship to God. Every time we choose Jesus, we worship. Our worship is our response to God all day, every day. No matter where you go, no matter what we do, our lives are an act of worship to our God because we are Jesus followers. If there is a God, and we believe there is, and if this Jesus rose from the grave and revealed to us who God is, which we believe he did, then we claim to be Christ-driven 24-7 Jesus followers, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, Jesus followers, right? Does that make sense? Now, this sermon, the things we're talking about today is, I'd like to call it highly introductory. (laughs) Uh, I'm really just setting the table for the next few weeks, and we're going to unpack even more what it looks like to be a Christ-driven 24-7 Jesus follower. What I want you to know is that we have a plan here as a church. We are working on it. well, your leaders are concerned about how God wants to work through this body, all right? We want you all to become, we want to help you become Christ-driven 24-7 Jesus followers. And we're going to unpack that more in the, last, in the next few weeks. It's, it's something that I'm really working on. Well, let's finish with some more if-then statements. Remember that if something is true, it impacts other applications, how many of you are familiar with the song by Hillsong called So Will I? Anybody out there? I see like one hand. Okay, there's a few of you. Um, it has some great messaging in it. I want to encourage you to give that song a listen, So Will I by Hillsong Light. Uh, but I want you to check it out if you've never heard it before. It's filled with if-then statements. It really is. Now, I want to read some of them to you. It says this, If the stars were made to worship, so will I. If creation sings your praises, so will I. If it all reveals your nature, that's speaking of creation, that Romans 1 passage we read earlier that reveals the nature of God. If, if it really truly reveals your nature, then I have a responsibility myself to reveal your nature. I want to do the same thing. So if creation still obeys you, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, now that's kind of a weird idea, (laughs) I'll admit, but so will I. If the oceans are roaring your greatness, then so will I. If everything exists, if everything in creation that you've made exists for the purpose of lifting you high, then so will I. If the wind is going to go wherever you send it, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. And then this is a weird one. (laughs) If the sum of all your praises still falls shy, then we'll sing it 100 billion times. 
that's a little bit different, right? Now, I love to sing worship songs. I love worship. I love singing. But I don't know if there's a song I want to sing 100 billion times. I don't know about you. Maybe that's a slight exaggeration. I don't know. Maybe that's not exactly your favorite part of this song. But all of this language that, I, that I've shared with you from this song is very poetic. Jason, you guys can come up now. We're wrapping up. It's all very image-based. It's very metaphorical. It's kind of emotional, really, if you get down to it. But that's not what our faith is built on. That's not what our beliefs are built on. That's not what this church was built on. It's not built off of poetic imagery. It's not built off of emotion. It's built off of these next couple of statements from the song. If you left the grave behind you, then so will I. God came into this world to leave death behind him. Why do we hold on to it? Why are you holding on to it? At C4, we're about leaving the grave behind. Here's another one. If you gladly choose surrender, think of the Christmas story, right? God choosing to surrender the day that he showed up in human form and he chose surrender throughout his entire life until he's pulled off of that cross, lifeless and dead. If our God can step into the world and choose surrender, are you willing to say, so will I? Can you gladly choose surrender to this God? Because at C4, we're going, we are all about choosing surrender to surrender to our God. And finally, the last if-then statement says this, if you gave your life to love them, then so will I. There's this realization that happens when you look around. (laughs) If you realize that God did all of this for you, then you lift your head and you recognize, it's not just for me. Look at all these people around me. There are all these people in this room too sharing, celebrating the same God. If God loved the people around me so much that he gave his life, why do I think that my life is more valuable? Why would I refuse? Do you want to know what C4 is about? Do you want to understand why it is that C4 exists? There is a God, and he has revealed himself in the person of Jesus who rose from the grave And we respond by leaving the grave behind us. We respond by choosing surrender. And we respond by loving the people in the world around us. Because that's what he did. And so will I. Let us pray when we're asked to make those choices. Sometimes which road we're going to go down, God, that we choose then we choose the one that is to follow you in all ways, God. God, to give up those things that don't bring us to where we need to be, Lord. We put our faith and we put our, our trust and our hope in you. I told you at the beginning that I struggle with feelings of inadequacy sitting up here. I don't, I don't feel good enough to be the person that God uses to share this stuff with you. I don't feel like it's my place. I don't feel like I've earned that. But here's the the amazing thing. Because even in the midst of my doubt and my fear and my anxiety, all those different things, I'm always brought back to the truth. And he tells me, I have been made perfect in him. I'm not good enough. <laughs> I'm not smart enough. I'm not, I can't do any of these things on my own. I am only able to do this because I want to surrender all of this stuff to him. And I give all of my life over to him so that he can use me in a way that I might not have ever imagined for myself. Any of my friends growing up would not have told you that I would be standing here. They'd say that was crazy. Somewhere in the midst of this journey, and I know not sure where God has you in this journey. Somewhere in the midst of it, I realized that I had to surrender. I had to give him over control of my life. And you know what he said? I've got something different in store for you. You're not going to believe this. I've got a different path for you. And it's not the one that you set out for yourself to do. It's not the one that you thought was going to be your life. But I promise you, it's going to be better. 
the things that I've set in store for you, the path that Jesus laid out for you before you were knit together in your mother's womb is maybe not the journey that you find yourself on right now. You might be making your own decisions and not allowing God the opportunity to shape and change and push you in the way he wants you to be. Well, we hope that this place, this who, what, why of C4 is going to help you jump into a place where you realize, I've got to let him have control. And if you do that, I think you will understand, you'll start to see, it'll be hard at first, but you're going to start to see that he shapes and changes things around you in a way that make you appreciate people, that make you love the positive things in your life, that make you be able to put the things that are negative in your life behind you and deal with them because you know God is riding right there with you. I don't know where God has you in your journey right now, but I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're sitting here this morning or listening to us online this morning because I think he has some things to say for us. And I think if we just trust him and we turn that stuff over to him, we give him control of our life, then he's going to make some miracles happen. That lady at the, begin- at the video, at the beginning of the series, she would, her heart was broken for children in Sudan. And she said, so am I. I will go because you want to send me. Don't ignore the plan that God has for you because he will make it blossom into something you never imagined if you just give him the chance. If God's got you in a place this morning where you need some help, you need some encouragement, you need support, we're going to sing an invitation song. You can come up here and we would love to pray for you, pray with you. If you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life because you've never done that before and you know that I've got to do that now, I've got to give him control, then we encourage you to do that as well. Come up here. We want to pray with you. We want to share with you and walk with you through this journey. You want to declare C4 as your church home and you've never done that. This is a perfect opportunity to come up here and say, this is my place. This is where God has set me and this is where I'm going to serve and do that. However, God's working in your heart this morning, I encourage you, stand with us as we sing our invitation song.